the letter it talks about how that Paul signed it, you know, with his own name, you know, in his own writing. So he definitely it was a collaboration, but of course the biggest collaboration was that that God worked through them to to get this written down. <laughs> and um, of course the theme of the the letter was you know the focus on Jesus Christ as the answer to the false teachings. The theme of this letter is clearly Christ, the fullness of God, and the preeminent, all-sufficient Savior. And we concluded it, uh, chapter 1 with, uh, just as the brethren at Colossae started to turn from God, we must work to maintain our relationship with God. We, can, we all came from a uh, life of sin. Reminder uh, that Jesus is supreme over everything, the fullness of God, worthy of our worship. We need to work and help others, encouraging each other. Um, so, I mean that it, it leads us into we're going to do a little, some a little uh, overlap here because we're going to look at because uh, Colossians one verse uh, twenty four, it the last part of Colossians chapter one we kind of briefly went over it last time, but um, it is really a start of a new. Th thought that carries into chapter 2, so we want to um, kind of go over um, starting in uh, Colossians 1 verse 24. <coughs> Excuse me. It says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body, that is the church. So, um, you know, of course, Apostle Paul is let, letting them know that, you know, he's really... Um, has a lot of sufferings for do, uh, uh, ministering to the saints and helping as an apostle. In, in Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6, I'd like to go, turn over there and read that on this idea exactly that, uh, you know, the time when Apostle Paul, or became Apostle Paul, because before that he was Saul, and he was very zealous for God. He was doing what he really thought was right in God's eyes, um, based on the, the learning of the Old Testament that he learned. He was a very um, uh, faithful uh, student of the old law, and so he thought he was really working hard for God and, and, try, and trying to snuff out this way, so to speak, in, um, in Acts 9 verse 4 says, Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, uh, Lord? Saul said, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, he replied. But get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So this is, of course, we know this story on the road to Damascus. He was taking letters from um, uh, Jerusalem, you know, say, you know, basically um, giving him the okay to uh, persecute the church, the, or the way, as it was a lot of times referred to, and, uh, and bring him back, you know, imprison him, and actually even put a lot of them to death. So that, that was his mission, going to Damascus to, to round up the Christians and bring them to justice in, in his eyes. And, but Jesus said, you know, why are you persecuting me? And, and uh, revealed himself to, to Paul. And that's when he became Paul and really uh, took that um, zeal that he had for persecuting the church. He turned it into a, a true zeal for um, serving, uh, serving the church and, and trying to promote the good news and the gospel that um, Jesus uh, revealed to him. And so, it, you know, just show, and, but it, here in our text, he's just saying he rejoices in the suffering for you. He's, he's helping to complete in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the body. He's, he's helping them by his affliction, by helping the church, helping them to, to um, gain uh, knowledge and wisdom of God's uh, true purpose and true word. Um, in verse 25 of our text, it says, I have become its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. And we just kind of um, touch base on this idea, you know, to the road, road to Damascus. You know, on that whole journey, that's where he was um, commissioned, basically, by Jesus 
to go out and, and to preach to the Gentiles and to, to truly become the Gentiles' apostle because God was revealing that the Gentile, and we know in prior um, circumstances, I think in Acts, where Peter um, realized, you know, that vision that he had of all these unclean animals and, and God basically said, arise and eat, and he's like, no way, that, that those are unclean, and he came out and let, let him know that, no, they're not unclean, and, and it was, that passage, uh, it, uh, it concludes so well, because it, it, Paul, or Peter wakes up and says, well, that means Gentiles are um, part of God's plan, too. I mean, it's just, that was the conclusion he came to, and it it was a neat uh, conclusion to that whole uh, thing that he was so adamant that he wasn't going to partake of that, but that when God explained it to him, saying the Gentiles were here. And so Paul, as he describes himself, was a, an apostle out of season, that he was chosen, um, and he was chosen specifically for the Gentiles, to, to be an apostle to the Gentiles, to let them know of the good news and the mystery. And we'll see that in our passage here. It says, in verse 25 it says, I have become its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for, for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that you may present everyone mature in Christ. I labor for this, striving with his strength that works powerfully in me. So he's just saying, letting them know, you know, this message or this mystery that was hidden for generations now is being revealed, and he he has the mission to reveal it to the, to the Gentiles as well. And I'd like to read in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22 on this idea, you know, about the, with allowing the Gentiles to be part of the fold. And I, I think he, um, Apostle Paul here, of course, is writing this one letter too to the Ephesians, but it, it, I think it really nails down the same um, concept here. Um, in verse 11 it says, So then remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised which is done in the flesh by human hands. <clears throat> and I think this passage is going to really relate to the, the context that we have in Colossians. But and it says in verse 12, At that time you were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are, were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Um, in verse 14, for he, he is our peace who made both groups one and tore down the dividing wall of hostility in his flesh. He made of no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the two resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by which he he put the hostility to death. He came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who were far away and peace so to those who were near. For through him we both have access to one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens uh, with the saints and members of God's household. Um, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as a cornerstone. In him the whole building, being put together, grow, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you, also, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the Spirit. And to really sum up that, that passage is he's letting the Gentiles know that, yeah, you guys were alienated, you guys were not part of God's people, but now, because of what Christ did in the, the um, dying on that cross and being raised from the dead, now he, he's taken that um, div dividing wall of hostility between the two and, and um, merged them into one man, as he says here, or one group that are now considered the, the 
true um, people of God. And so, and, and it really goes in uh, well, this passage goes in well with our text, because in our text, you remember, um, there was both Gentiles and Jewish um, believers here in, in Colossae, in, in these churches, and there were some intermingling here, you know, the, the Jews, and, and keep and remember, and, um, and I believe this was um, kind of talked about in the study la this last Thursday. I didn't, I didn't, wasn't able to participate, but Rebecca was telling me kind of some of it. But that, you know, how that the Jews, um, we really have to think of this, when they become Christian, they still, it, it's something new, and they, it, you know, they had to turn away from all their old traditions, and that had to have been really hard. And so a lot of them, I think, wanted to keep trying to hold on to some of the, maybe some of their favorite traditions that they felt that, you know, was right to, uh, to be pleasing to God. And, and, but it was kind of difficult. And so they were trying to implement some of that and even trying to convince some of the Gentiles that they needed to be part of those tra traditions. And Apostle Paul in our text here is going to say, no, that's not the case. Christ is supreme over everything. That is the true answer. That is the, the unifying message that gets us together, no matter wh what our backgrounds are, wh where we came from. Jesus Christ and Him crucified is what we need to rely on and to focus on to truly uh, uh, make do right in God's sight. That's how the wisdom and understanding from God is truly um, through the message of the cross. And in um, Colossians chapter 2 in our text, we'll start in verse 1, it says, For I want you to know how greatly I am struggling for you, for those in Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me in person. So that would include all of us. I mean, anybody that, you know, Apostle Paul is trying to connect with, even people that have never met him, have never seen him, that would imply, apply to each and every one of us here today. And it says in verse 2, I want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love, so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I love how they, they say that, because that, that's what we're really seeking for, is... Um, uh, treasures of wisdom and knowledge uh, to grow in the, the our walk as Christians in, in this life. Sorry, my throat's starting to get a little rough there. Um, and it's it's not like we're trying to get some special knowledge. We're just tapping into the knowledge that Jesus revealed to us um, through His life here on earth, and, and just to reveal the nature of God to us. And I, I'm saying this so that no one will deceive you with arguments that sound reasonable. For I may be absent in body, but I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see how well ordered you are and the strength of your faith in Christ. And um, I'd like to read another passage that Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 31, uh, the, on the same idea that sometimes people try to interject other ideas into Christianity to try to make it sound even more elaborate than it, that it needs to be. And, um, and here in Corinth, they also had some intermingling of Jewish ideas and Gentile ideas, and, and so it, it really um, is a very good parallel uh, concept here. So let's read in verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 1. It says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God to us who are being saved. And that's a neat concept, you know, and I know there's a, another passage, I'm not sure where it's at, but it says that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. Um, you know, so it's the same idea here, saying, here, if someone's not really seeking God, they're going to think it's just kind of, you know, foolishness and, and not even really give it any consideration. But for those who are being saved, those who are truly understanding God's wisdom, that's where the power is, is in that understanding of His, of his will. In verse 19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will set aside the intelligence of the intelligent. 
Where is the one who is wise? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the debater of the, this age? Hasn't God made the world's wisdom foolish? For since in God's wisdom the world did not know God through wisdom, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of what is preached. And by the way, he's doing kind of more of a contrast, just saying the, the wisest thing in the world is um, less than the, the, fool, the foolishness of God. And of course, there is no real foolishness of God, but um, in what people think is foolish, you know, the, the plan of salvation, that's foolishness to a lot of people, but that is the power of God. That's where he demonstrates his power. He's just making a, a, a very obvious uh, contrast here. And, um, but he says, um, because it's not, we're really not preaching foolishness. That's just what the world sees it as, is foolishness, because it's way too simple. How on earth can that be how God works? It's so simple that it's to them it's foolishness. And, um, and then verse 24 says, Yet to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Um, because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. And like I said, you know, there is no foolishness in God's um, wisdom, and there is no weakness in, in God's strength. It's just showing that severe contrast, saying you take the, the strongest man or the wisest man and, you know, these simple things that God has um, put all his power in is far wiser than, than anybody in the world. Um, in verse 26, brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many were wise in, from a human perspective, not many powerful, not many of noble birth. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insufficient and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something, so that no one may boast in his presence. It is from him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom for, from God for us, our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So we need to always focus our life on Jesus. And this idea that, you know, he's saying that, well, well that's a side note, but we want to get back to our text in verse 6, because um, he's going to be talking about the spiritual fullness in Christ, that Christ is the true answer to, to everything to any disputes, to any uh, divisions in the church, it, Christ is the answer. And if we all just focus on Christ and doing our best to live according to, to Christ's uh, will, then there won't be this, the divisions in, in the church. We will be in uni unified in that spirit, just as um, he's called us to do. In verse 6 it says, So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him. And, and I like this because he's saying, just because you received Jesus and you, you went through the plan of salvation, now you have a lifelong commitment to continue to walk in him. It's a, it's a, a daily um, journey that we have to take to, to, in order to be pleasing to him. And we, it's a, a work that we have to just continue to work on um, regardless of, uh, you know, who's, you know what, what circumstances that we're in. In verse 7, being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. Be careful to not to, that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world rather than Christ. And so th this kind of sums up what he was saying to the Cor Corinthians is saying, you know, that some people look for a sign, some say it's all foolishness, uh, they want a special knowledge, and he's saying, you know, don't let them take you captive by these, uh, th th through philosophy or empty deceit, um, based on human tradition, but based on, or based on the elements of the world, but rather focus on Christ and Him crucified. That is the true answer to everything in our life. In Galatians 1, verses 6 through 9, 
on this same idea. And here he was, he, he was a little more harsh with these, this group in Galatians. Um, he says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly turned away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is a, another gospel, but there are some who are troubling you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we preach to you, a curse be on him. And as we have said before, I now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, a curse be on him. So he's just saying, you know, reiterating this idea that some people will try to draw you away or pervert the gospel of Christ. And he's saying, you, you know what you were, how you were established. Stick with it. Stand firm in that and, and grow in that knowledge and stay true to, to God um, and, and what you've been received. And don't let anybody try to draw you away. In verse 9 of our text, <coughs> Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 says for the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ so everything of God's nature dwelled in Christ in the bodily form and you have been filled by him who is the head over every ruler and authority and I'd like to turn into the Old Testament Genesis 17 verses 11 through 14 on this idea you know of uh, because we're getting ready to be talking about circumcision and you know circumcision with the flesh and circumcision with the uh, and I just wanted to show a reference here of, from the Old Testament the original circumcision but it says you must circumcise the flesh of your foreskin to serve as a, a sign of the covenant between me and you throughout your generations every male among you is to be circumcised at, in, at eight days old Every male born in your household or purchased from the, uh, any foreigner and not your offspring, whether born in your household or purchased, he must be circumcised. My covenant will be marked in your flesh as a permanent covenant. If any male is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that man will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Um, so back to our passage in Colossians verse 11, says, you are also circumcised in him with a circumcision not done with hands by putting on the body of, of, off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So here, the circumcision is a spiritual circumcision and it's through um, our obedience of the plan of salvation in, in, through baptism and um, it's kind of a weird analogy but that's when we enter into a covenant relationship with God that that's why he referenced it as the circumcision just like the circumcision of old that was an outward sign bodily sign that they were um, in a covenant relationship with God between them and, uh, and God. And so here, baptism is our um, so, our sign uh, that we have, are in a relationship with God and Christ. And so it, it, it's very significant. And that, that's why people that uh, dismiss baptism is, is completely missing the mark altogether. Because that's where we become it, we enter into that covenant relationship with God and Christ is through that our submission to the plan of salvation and that, that final grave of baptism we're raised a new creation and, and as he says here and then uh, verse 13 and when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh he made you alive with him and forgave all our trespasses he erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that were, was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. So, you know, again, Jesus, you know, is, is all sufficient. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them uh, in him. So, you know, Jesus uh, put it to rest in, uh, completely, saying, you know, we now we have a, a new way in order to be right with God and, and 
all the past that our past sins are taken are completely washed clean that never to be held against us again and um, in Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 through 17 on the same idea it says finally be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength put on the full armor of God so that you can stand stand against the schemes of the devil for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. And remember, we just read in our passage that he's triumphed over that. He, he, he basically embarrassed all of the, that, but we still fight against that. Um, and we know if we follow after Christ, then we can tap into that strength and, and triumph over them as well. And he, he's given us kind of, uh, you know, uh, symbolism of how we can actually uh, fight against these uh, forces. Uh, it says, verse 14, Stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like an armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the hel helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So, uh, just on this idea of how we can tap into this strength, but it all resides in um, doing stuff for, for God and Christ, and looking to Christ as the answer to all, all our troubles here on earth. In verse 16 of our text, it says, Therefore, do not let anyone, and this one was uh, really confusing to me in, in the beginning, um, but... You know, because uh, but it says, therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food or drink, or in the matter of festival or new moon or a Sabbath day. And it was kind of how did how can I not let allow people to judge me? But um, just keep in mind, remember, there was Jewish people and, and um, Gentiles, and they were trying to for you know say you have to do these things in order to be pleasing to God. And um, he's saying. That, that's not what it is. Christ is sufficient for everything. And, and, um, but I, I, there's, a, there's several passages I want to look at that kind of help, I think, explains it a little clearer than this. But let's read through 19 here. Um, These are a shadow of what was to come. A sub, the substance is Christ. Um, let, let no one condemn you by delighting in aesthetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access... Uh, to a vision, visionary realm. Such people are inflated by empty notions of their unspiritual mind. Uh, he does not hold on to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons, grows with growth from God. So he's just saying that, you know, these things are, you know, basically um, they're trying to convince you that you need to do these things in order to be pleasing to God. And he's saying, Christ, and center your life around Christ and what he did. That's what's important in our life. And then Romans um, 14, verses 1 through 21, <laughs> I'd like to read, read through that. Um, it, this one, I think, kind of gives you a little clearer picture of how we can not allow people to judge us. Or, and, and I think he's, trying, he's relating something similar to this, but this is kind of an idea of, how that we need to, you know, it may not be wrong for us to do certain things, but if other people are weak, brethren are weak, we might we need to consider through love that we consider one another more important than ourselves, as like we read in Philippians um, chapter two this morning. It says, um, but in verse one it says, welcome anyone who is weak in faith, but don't argue about disputed matters. One person believes he may eat anything, while one who is weak eats only vegetables. One who eats must not look down on one who does not eat, and one who does not eat must not judge the one who does, because God has accepted him. Who are you to judge another's household servant? Before his own Lord he stands or falls, and he will stand because the Lord is able to make him stand. One person judges one day to be more important than another day. Someone else judges every day to be the same. Kind of um, this idea of what we were just talking about in our text. Um, 
let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. Whoever observes a day, observes it for the honor of the Lord. Whoever eats, eats for the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. And whoever does not eat, it is for the Lord that he does not eat. Uh, eat it, and he gives thanks to God. For none of us live for himself, and no one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and returned to life for this, um, that he might be Lord over both the dead and the living. But you, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or, do, or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me and every tongue will praise to, give praise to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us no longer judge one another. Instead, decide never to put a stumbling block or pitfall in the way of your brother or sister. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. Still, to some, someone who considers a thing to be unclean, to that one it is unclean. For if your brother or sister is hurt by what you eat, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy what you eat someone, but by what you eat, someone for whom Christ died. Um, so he's just, I think, and I think this is how we can say, you know, don't let anybody judge you for these days and stuff, is we need to consider one another and, uh, you know, look to each other and, and try to help them through, by teachings of Christ to bring them to see it more clearly, but never to, to judge them and try to um, convince them that what they're doing is wrong, but to show them in the scriptures how, you know, you know kind of like Aquila and Priscilla, they took him aside to teach him more um, clearly. It's just we have to do it in a loving manner in order to be pleasing to God. Verse 20 of our text, If you died with Christ to the elements or elementary principles of this world, why, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. All these, and, and I think this is more of a, a relation, this might be a reference to the gentile or the paganistic um, approaches that some of them are trying to bring into their religion, uh, to the to the church. Uh, but, um, as all these regulations refer to what is destined to perish by being used up, they are human commands and doctrines. Although these have a reputation for wisdom by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and severe treatment of the body, they are not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. <laughs> And then uh, let's go ahead and read in Galatians chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. <coughs> Galatians 4, verses 8 through 11. It says, But in the past, since you did, didn't know God, you were enslaved to things that by nature are not God's. But now, since you know God, or rather have been become known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elements or elementary principles? Do you want to be enslaved to them all over again? You are observing special days, months, seasons, and years. I am fearful for you that perhaps my labor for you has been wasted. So Apostle Paul is definitely, you know, letting them know that, you know, those things aren't um, beneficial as Christians, but like he was saying in uh, Ephesians, we got to consider one another, just like in Philippians 2, you know, we got to put their interests above our own. If they think it's wrong to do certain things on certain days, then we need to ease them into them, and, and maybe uh, we can do, uh, you know, what we know to be true, in private, but in public, you, you don't want to just flaunt, say, well, I know, I understand better, I know uh, more, so I'm going to do it regardless of what you believe, but 
we have to do things in love and to consider one another in order to, to be right with God. But we have to, the easiest and best way to truly get to a unification, of course, is Christ and, and doing what Christ wants us to do and trying to um, uh, bring people away from all those other things that, were, that are encumbering them to um, not be true to God. Um, in conclusion, we are all one in Christ. Um, no matter where we come from, no matter, uh, you know, Jews, Gentiles, everybody was, it became one in Christ. Christ died for all of us. And we must stand firm in our faith in Christ, staying true to what we learn from, from the Bible. We must not judge one another by what stage they are in their development as Christians. We must be patient with each other through love. And we must not allow anyone to persuade us to turn from Jesus, letting them judge us by their ideas. And I'd like to read, read Romans 14, verses 13 through 15. It says, Therefore let, no, no, let us no longer judge one another. Instead, decide never to put a stumbling block or pitfall in the way of your brother or sister. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that no, nothing is unclean in itself, Still, to someone who considers a thing to be unclean, to that, that one it is unclean. For if your brother or sister is hurt by what you eat, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy what, by what you eat someone from whom Christ died. So he's saying Christ died for each and every one of us. And if you're, what you're doing is causing them to stumble, causing them to, to lose their faith, then we need to make sure that, you know, then it said, like he said there, we're not living um, by love any longer. If we got, we have to consider one another um, before us. I mean, if Jesus did that to us, said, well, I know better. I'm not going to um, become that sacrifice. I don't de deserve this. I don't need it. Then, you know, then he wouldn't have done it in love. But he showed us perfect love by um, becoming that perfect sacrifice um, on the cross. That in, in just like it said in um, uh, Philippians two, it says this attitude in, that was you use this same attitude that was in Jesus, and then went on to describe exactly what Jesus did and how he gave up everything he had. Um, to become in the flesh and to become that perfect sacrifice that we so desperately needed. And we don't want to close the lesson without extending the invitation. We all here know the steps of the plan of salvation. Of course, um, we need to hear the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. And then we need to um, believe, have faith uh, in Hebrews 11 and 6. And then we have to repent. Um, uh, turn away from the, our sins uh, and make that commitment. Acts 2 verse 38 and then of course Matthew 10 32 that we need to uh, acknowledge um, Christ before man, uh, have that confession and then of course the, the watery grave of baptism. Just as we um, stated in our text today, this, uh, this plan of salvation, that's how we enter into a covenant relationship with God and Christ. That's, that's how we enter into that um, relationship that has promise and hope in our life is through, through this plan of salvation. And as God described that no sin prior to that point, none of our past sins will be held against us. They, like in the Old Testament, they were rolled forward from year to year. They were reminded that their sins weren't truly forgiven. And, but here... Once Christ, that perfect sacrifice came, now it is completely forgiven. That we, but then there is a plan that God has set up for Christians because He knows that we're going to fall short from time to time, and we need to make things right with Him, just like we did the day that we were went, went through that plan of salvation. We can have that clean slate like we did then. But uh, now we have, we can confess our faults one to another. Have uh, we have to have that same repentance that we had on the day that we were baptized? That that turning away from you know in our hearts first, turning away from sin, and and also 
that prompts us to turn away from our sin in, in our actions, and then having the prayers on our behalf, again, all the sins before that are, are um, completely wiped away, and we have that clean slate once again. That's how, just like he said, that we need to stand firm and continue in him, and we do that by, you know, court, the, one of the biggest keys to continuing to, to live for God and Christ is through a repentant heart and doing our best to turn away from sin and turn to, towards God and Christ. And Or if there's anyone here that, you know, um, just need the prayer of the church on their behalf, we invite you to come forward as we stand, sing, stand and sing the selected song.